I'm here today with Larry Zulch, CEO of Infinity Energy Systems, and we're going to be discussing the transition to renewable energy, perhaps accelerated by the massive increase in energy prices and the Russian-Ukraine situation, and where in that energy storage fits in. Larry, thanks so much for joining us. Well, it's good to be with you. So, first of all, let's start off with the escalating cost of oil and gas. Is this accelerating the transition to renewable energy? And who will be the winners? Well, of course, uh, economics drives everything in energy because, um, you know, we, we have to have a reliable energy supply and, uh, and, and we want to pay as little for it as possible. Oil and gas has been subsidized for decades. And so as, as we are also seeing, though, that the costs of oil and gas are quite high and they're high in dependence on other countries. Um, they're also high in terms of the environmental consequences. And when that gets reflected in prices, then the, the alternatives that may make more sense in terms of energy independence and an environment, uh, they become more compelling. So we, we look at that as a very positive direction. So broadly speaking, who will be the winners? Solar, wind, who are going to be the main winners from this? Well, like many of these things, it starts with a core um, moving from what we think of as a load following technologies. These are ones where when when the demand goes up, more people need energy, they're able to turn their uh, their production up. And then when the demand goes down, they can turn it down. When you move to renewables, and those are going to be winners, but they're a fundamentally source-following technology. You can't make energy from solar if there's no sun or wind when there's no wind. So those have a a different set. Those are going to be winners, but then that's going to have a new uh, uh, sort of follow-on implications, and then those will be winners. So it's like everything else. It, it, It broadens out from this core concept of a transition that we're making from oil and gas to renewables and all those implications. And who then benefits beyond the actual source of solar and wind, et cetera? Well, that's where our area of interest comes in because energy storage is required to fill in the missing hours. You know, each, each, each day will be full of hours where for one reason or another, renewable isn't available. Now, when renewable is a very small part of the energy uh, production, well, then it doesn't really matter. The other sources will, will fill in the gaps. But when it's a large part of it, there can be many missing hours. Sometimes those are just short periods of time, sometimes longer. And we don't want to fill those in with peak or plants that are using natural gas or whatever. We want to fill them in with the renewable energy itself. Every year, we uh, all over the world, and certainly in the UK, throw away lots of energy. Um, we, we, it just it isn't used because the wind is providing it at a time when people can't consume it. If we can store energy when it's available for use when it's needed, then that's going to be terrific. So storage is a very big deal. Many companies are looking at it at this point. So what are the current options for long duration energy storage? I think pumped hydro is the largest source, but can you talk about that and the other sources as well? Uh, Pumped hydro is a proven technology that's used anywhere where there are enough elevation change for it to make sense, where there's enough water for it to make sense. Where I live in California, um, there's quite a bit of pumped hydro, but we're not putting in any new plants. And even if we were to start putting them in, they take decades to get through the environmental reviews and damming up uh, some some uh, valley somewhere and going through all that process. And, and I haven't been seeing all the big mountains in England either recently that are gonna be providing the opportunity for pumped hydro there. So it looks like what certain regions will, will benefit from it. And then others, they have to look for alternative technologies. And that's where batteries come in. You know, batteries, just big energy storage devices. That's, that's the, the, uh, the requirement in a lot of areas. And what options do you have in batteries? I know your vanadium flow, but what are the other options and what are the advantages and disadvantages? 
And the, the majority of the market in battery storage right now is lithium ion batteries. And they're very good technology. The ener- they're very energy dense. That certainly, uh, you know, when with our cell phones and as, as cars are electrified and all over, we're going to see lots and lots of lithium ion batteries. But, you know, we're going to look back on this period years in the future and say, can you imagine that we wasted hundreds and thousands of vehicle opportunities putting lithium batteries in a field, in a box, in a field, and then using them in a way that they really aren't good for? And that is constantly cycling. We all know that our lithium batteries in, in phones after just a couple of years of use, uh, you know, are, don't have the capability of storing what they did when we first got them. Well, imagine that in a much larger scale. And that's um, that, that leaves an opportunity for other chemistries, as we say, other battery technologies. But n- nothing else has been developed as far along as lithium. And so we're seeing a whole array of technologies. Ours is one of them. We see it as fairly far along. We're actually in production in a standardized product. We're shipping it into projects. We, uh, we have our first project and second project of the next of the latest generation in the field working. So as soon as as soon as you have more than one, you know that it's a standardized product that's um, that's being implemented. And what about sodium and hydrogen? Where do they fit in, and what are their advantages and disadvantages against vanadium flow batteries? Well, let me start with hydrogen. And hydrogen is an important technology. It's it's not in itself an energy producing technology. It's it's for transmission. Um, one way or the other, if you're moving hydrogen, you're making energy somewhere, storing it in the hydrogen or transmitting it with hydrogen, and then um, making it available, you know, wherever you need it. And so as a transmission technology, as a storage technology, hydrogen has its uses and and can be quite uh, effective at that. But it has to be created with renewable sources or or or, or it doesn't make sense because if you're if you're using natural gas to make hydrogen, you might as well burn the natural gas and and um, and make electricity from it. Uh, so so hydrogen is an interesting technology. It's not even slightly competitive what we're doing. In fact, in uh, up in the Orkney Islands, we are working with EMEC, the European Marine Energy Center, to uh, take tidal power, put it into our battery, so there's a consistent source of supply to go into an electrolyzer making hydrogen. And so that's green hydrogen and using using batteries. Other technologies, uh, you know, there have been many, many technologies like the ones you've mentioned, the sodium uh, technology. Some of the them are operating at 300 degrees centigrade. They work. There's a difference between working and working well. <laughs> and working well means that, and that's what we're always looking for, what we call utility-grade energy storage. Is it going to last a long time? Is it safe? Is it economical? Is it the best alternative characteristics for the situation? And that, and for filling in the missing hours from renewables, we don't know of a better technology than ours. Um, and that includes lithium, which is not as safe because it is prone to catching fire when you put enough of it together. It doesn't last as long. It degrades over time. It's the the advantage that lithium has right now is it's available and uh, and and it is and it is popular and and we're all for it in our cars and everywhere else. We just don't think it belongs in a in a box in a field. <laughs> so um, vanadium flow batteries, as I understand it, they're more efficient, but they take up more space. So as you say, in a field, they are ideal, but perhaps not so good in a car. Am I right? Yeah, that's true. You will never see a vanadium flow battery in a car. Um, the, the advantage of vanadium flow batteries are that they don't degrade. It's a water-based electrolyte that stores the electricity that's fantastic but they they are big and heavy uh, they'll never be in a car they'll never be in your cell phone but when they're our batteries are the size of a shipping container and you can put them right next to each other because they don't catch fire and then and stack them on top of each other as we do so the density per acre can be quite good but but they're 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 very specific they're very purpose-built for connecting into the uh, energy grid for commercial operation where solar needs to be moved from when it's made during the day to being consumed in the evening. 
Uh, that's that's when vanadium flow batteries make the most sense. So very much for infrastructure. That's right. That's right. So what's happening in the U.S. with Biden's infrastructure bill? You know, I, I think the Biden administration saw the need for energy independence and the move to renewable energy um, very, very clearly. And, and so this trillion dollar infrastructure bill included billions of dollars for the battery supply chain. And as, as the energy secretary, Jennifer Granholm, said, um, flow makes sense. And, uh, and she said that because the, the U.S. is concerned about too much dependence on lithium. Lithium is important, but there are better technologies in other places. So we've had support from the California Energy Commission, and we're looking to get support from um, other government a- agencies in the United States to help produce locally to um, the U.S. Uh, the kind of technologies that make sense for, for making the energy grid in the U.S., renewable dependent and independent of foreign sources. And something that Andrew Monk from VSA Capital has talked about is the frequency response companies exploiting the energy situation, supplying the grid using old gas and diesel engines. How much of this is happening? There's quite a bit, because as we've seen, the UK energy grid has been less stable than um, than we would want. Um, and the, it didn't help that that uh, the inner tie into the French grid had some problems and prevented using that uh, energy from France when it was needed. And so all of a sudden, energy prices would tend to spike. And then when the wind would start blowing, then the prices would come down or the sun would, would shine. But during those times when they aren't available, filling in those missing hours, how is that going to be done? Well, doing it with something besides um, uh, inefficient and expensive fossil fuel-based products, that, 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 that would be a great alternative. And that certainly is what we're doing with Energy Super Hub Oxford. There's a project that does do fast frequency, frequency response um, and, and is a perfect example of why name flow batteries make sense. We can cycle them as often as needed. In, at Energy Super Hub Oxford, the flow battery there, the largest flow battery in the UK, uh, is able to respond quickly to needs of the grid as, as it changes and supply that supplemental power that we're going to need more and more of. So we have to provide alternatives to these uh, natural gas fired peaking plants. And, and that's where energy storage really shines. And with the current economic situation, can we see a major move to bring battery metal supply back to the West? And does this impact the battery supply chain and, of course, the long duration energy storage situation? Yeah, I mean, when we look at the market, you know, we we look at suppliers and suppliers of uh, the materials required for for batteries and for our batteries. And certainly metals are, are an important part of that. Um, and then we look at manufacturers and then we look at the, 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 the companies that are actually putting in the projects and then ones who are running the projects. So if we go all the way back to the supplier side, the first thing is have a, uh, not to have a dependence on foreign sources or limited sources of products. And, and we certainly see that that provides challenges for some. Vanadium is more available in the world um, than, and there's more of it in the Earth's crust than copper. So there's a lot of vanadium around. And in fact, that's one of the important things is to support the circular economy. If right now there's a big push to have low sulfur bunker fuel being used by ships, and that requires putting it through a catalyst. You know what clogs up the catalyst? Vanadium. So from our perspective, it's a fantastic thing to have those spent catalysts that are no longer useful for that. We are working with companies that are extracting the vanadium out of use catalysts. And this is going to be this circular economy of using uh, industrial waste for vanadium. Fantastic. Otherwise, we're seeing a lot of push toward local production um, of, of critical materials. And, and that's certainly an opportunity in, in a lot of different areas. Batteries that require specific rare uh, uh, elements and minerals, those, those really have a lot of work to do. Fortunately for us, uh, the name flow batteries are not in that situation. Is there anyone that controls the supply of vanadium? Uh, where are you sourcing it from mainly? And is demand going to push the price up? Yeah, very good questions. 
since vanadium is so common, um, there are many different sources of it, and we have taken advantage of of, of the geographic distribution of vanadium. There's uh, a lot of vanadium made in, in Africa, in South Africa. We worked with Bushfeld there. Uh, there's uh, vanadium coming online from Australia. Uh, U.S. Vanadium is, is a company that we're working with that um, pulls um, vanadium out of the industrial waste stream, a very good example of that circular economy, and, and then out of China. So you can see we're, we're getting vanadium from many different places and, and, and electrolyte uh, from those places. That's fantastic. Right now, vanadium is uh, mainly used to harden metals. And so as we come into the market and as we start using significant amounts of it, there be that will be a signal to create more in our capitalist economy. And if that occurs, then we see that the price will stay stable. But it is always possible that the price will go up, um, especially if uh, more production is not coming online. So that's something that we pay attention to. Don't, um, it's something that we're, we, we believe will be solved over time, and we're looking for ways to minimize the variation as we go along. But to date, you haven't really experienced any volatility in the price. No, we, we haven't. I mean, in, in part because um, the vanadium battery industry has moved from being a, a technology um, in, in the laboratory or still to be proven, the one that is proven. It is a working technology, but we're at the beginning of the ramp up. So we're not using so much vanadium as to have a major impact on the, on the price of it uh, at this point. But we, we certainly anticipate needing enough that there will have to be additional supply, and that's the opportunity for the market to supply it. So how big is the market for long duration energy storage and what percentage is likely to be taken by vanadium flow batteries? When you think about the market size, you think how important are renewables? You can't do renewables without some kind of long duration energy storage. They just go hand in hand. And, and we, we thought the market was large, very large. It just the events of the past week have increased the uh, size or speed of um, how that market will grow. Uh, you know, with Germany announcing their desire to get to energy independence, they're going to be looking at a lot more wind power than they have right now. And then, and what does that mean? Long duration energy storage. So, you know, we, we look at the market will be separated across multiple technologies providing different requirements, but for those missing hours for that, Long duration, as we call it, the four to eight to 12 hour storage, not the short duration of half an hour. Uh, you know, we, we as, as Infinity have set a goal of being 10% of the global stationary energy storage market um, by 2030. And we believe that's entirely achievable, especially because our, our partnership with Siemens Gamesa to design and build the next generation of flow batteries. Um, and we're in process on that. That's uh, that's not an announced product yet. The, the partnerships announced, the product isn't. So we're at that period where we're we're um, designing, building, and working on that product together. Um, you know that that's incredibly promising and part of the support for why we think we can get to that size of what will be you know a many tens of billions of pounds market. So how many gigawatt or megawatt hours is that if you supply 10% of the total market? There, there, there are many different projections at this point. And part of that depends on how quickly you believe we can make that shift. It is in you know, tens and even hundreds of gigawatt hours of billions of uh, of watts stored for an hour and, and that capability. And that when, when you think about the requirements across the entire market, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at over a hundred gigawatt hours of energy uh, storage is going to be required just over the next five to eight years. And that's a, a tremendous opportunity for a company like us. And does that take enormous capex, sort of trillions of dollars to gear up for that? I think that we will see massive investment in the trans energy transition, and it will be supported by governments around the world, certainly with Biden and his trillion dollar infrastructure plan with billions of dollars going into energy. And that's not all that's required. And there's more we anticipate in the United States 
We certainly have seen Germany just announced that they are going to be accelerating their energy transition, and for very good reason. Um, that's more government support for it. All of that capital has been um, uh, already talked about for this, and then more will come along. And a lot of it will be capital that's redeployed out of subsidies that are still going on for oil and gas. And we see that as something that will be an accelerating transition because as the uh, support for oil and gas is reduced and the prices go up, it makes the renewable energy more compelling, which will then attract more uh, capital and more support, which will then increase that ex and accelerate that process. And there's this, uh, a classic way that, uh, that academics view the transition from one technology to the other, and they call it an S-curve. It starts out slow, and then it starts accelerating as the change occurs, and it rapidly makes a transition. And people watching that initial slow uh, change think, mm, I think this will take years and years and years to happen. But then it goes through a transition and then climbs. And then it's called an S-curve because at some point, it doesn't go to 100%. At some point, something else comes along and it starts tapering off again. That's the top of the curve. Well, clearly on the energy transition, we're just at the beginning of that curve and it's going to be enormous. For Infinity, with our Vanadium flow batteries, we're right at the beginning of that transition and probably a little earlier on. So we're also anticipating the ramp of, of uh, take up of what we're doing and that we'll see that follow that S-curve as well. But if you're sitting in Germany at the moment and you've got 40% of gas coming from, from Russia, you're wanting this to happen pretty quickly. How quickly can things get into gear and be accelerated? Maybe perhaps like medicine was during COVID, can things be fast-tracked to really make a difference for, say, Germany's supply within the next, you know, within months, let alone years? I mean, we certainly know that uh, many times it's um, getting uh, support for projects through governments and through regulations, environmental reviews, and that kind of thing that are the gating factor on the timing. And when those are accelerated and when people are motivated to move quickly, they can move surprisingly quickly. But that said, it, these, are, these are big projects and they do take time. And no matter how quickly we want to move, um, you know, building new um, new facilities, new capabilities in solar and putting in new wind installations and putting in new storage, um, it, it's going to take years. And, and it's going to be painful during that time for that transition. But if, if we don't start now, um, you know, then it'll just be delayed into the future. And so I think we're going to see a real commitment to moving as fast as possible. And I think that, that rather than a five to 10 year process to really make a difference, um, it will be over the course of one, two or three years. And that certainly fits with our timeline where we are working, taking this our technology, our products, we, we, we still talk about technology sometimes, but really that's underneath what we're now delivering, which is energy storage as a product. That, that we will see that um, uh, we and others who have those products will be able to ramp up quite quickly. And talk to us a little bit about the UK government award to develop the 40 megawatt project with Pivot Power and EDF. How important is this? Well, this was a, a, something we were very proud to announce uh, yesterday that we were one of the winners of, of this long duration energy storage program. Uh, and what the program is working to do um, is, is, is make possible long duration energy storage or make more commercially viable long duration energy storage. So the UK government is saying, how can we help progress this important technology? We applied for this alongside EDF and Pivot, which um, are the developers of Energy Sub Super of Oxford. So it, it shows that they were happy with what we did together in Energy Super of Oxford. But unlike that project, what we propose instead of five megawatt hours of flow batteries and 50 megawatt hours of lithium batteries in the one that we've proposed together uh, into, this, into this program, it's 40 plus 40. So the flow batteries do a lot of the work. And then when they need an extra 
an extra uh, amount of power to come in, um, the lithium batteries are sitting there ready to do that. And the great thing about that is they aren't called on so often as to wear out quickly. So this is actually an ideal application for, for energy storage. So it was big for us to get the UK government support um, to demonstrate that we are working well with EDF and Pivot to look at the size of the market. And finally, to be um, proposing a 40 megawatt hour battery that's eight times the size of, of the Energy Super of Oxford, which is the largest flow battery in the UK. And I might note the most number of flow batteries ever put on a single site in the world. So we have put 162 individual units working in concert to act like one big battery. And that's never been done before. It's working. We're very, very pleased with it. Wow. I, I thought it was a competition. Are there any other than the three of you taking part in it? And also, I think this is phase one. And what are the KPIs to get to phase two? Right, right. right. So it is a competition and, and, and others did win. There were three winners in the top category and then a number of winners in, in, a, in a different category. So we were given, um, uh, I believe it was 700,000 pounds to help put together the proposal for the next phase. And so one of the three of us or potentially two of the, of the three of the um, winners of this phase will go on to the next one and, and receive government support for the actual project. What we received was support for putting together the proposal for this, for this project and also making moves toward commercialization. And what does that mean for our purposes? Have, taking the product and, and, and working on improving its cost, it's always a constant desire to make every new product as it comes out and it's more expensive because there are relatively few being made, bring its cost down. And also it's deliverability, as we say, the ability to just put something on site, plug it in and have it work. And so having the UK's government support for making progress in those areas means that they're thinking about energy storage the right way and the way that we think about it, which is that, that alternatives to lithium need to be developed that are as easily plug and play, as we say, just ready to go, um, built in a standardized fashion at, a, at an economical price. And, and that alignment with our goals is very important. And if it goes to the second phase part funded by the BIS, where's the rest of the funding going to come from? So EDF um, would has to um, make a significant investment toward that. They've indicated that they are um, not just interested in doing that. They want to, to make that investment. Um, EDF is looking at um, energy storage as a critical pillar of the energy infrastructure moving forward. So this will be uh, um, EDF providing that additional funding in, in addition to the BEIS funding. And you're also working with Siemens Gamesa. What's happening there? How's that progressing? So the Siemens Gamesa project, we've announced that it is uh, building the next generation of flow battery. And this is a flow batteries at a scale that are appropriate for large infrastructure use, where we measure the, the size of the projects in hundreds of megawatt hours. And in fact, the smallest one we envision uh, putting a project we envision supporting with this, this development is about 200 megawatt hours and going up from there, because right now, large wind installations require that kind of storage to be able to make a meaningful difference to make sure that the energy they're creating is used when it's needed. So Siemens Gamesa and, and Gamesa Electric have, have chosen our product um, after a, a lot of research is the one that, that made the most sense to them, the most refined technology and the furthest along the path toward making something appropriate for wind. They've, they've used uh, lithium ion batteries before uh, in projects and, and they undoubtedly will again, but they wear out quite quickly and don't really last as long as a, a wind turbine years instead of tens of years. And the promise of our technology and what we're co-developing is the next generation of that will last for the same length of time as a wind turbine. So you're buying a 25 year uh, energy producing asset. You want to match it with a 25 year energy storage asset. And that's, that's, that's very promising. It's going well. We are not announcing the product at this point. We're not talking in details. 
we're keeping it quiet until we have something where we can say, here's what we're building. Here's how much it costs. Here's when it's available. Please order it. And doing that jointly and having all of the support of Siemens Gamesa in, in doing that. That's a process and, and we're, we're getting there, but it will be um, no earlier than the end of this year um, and, and no later than somewhat early next year um, when we have that, that joint announcement that this is what we've developed together. And do you want to keep production in the East or do you want to bring it to the West, bearing in mind the geopolitical situation? And is there any geography you're better set up to serve? It's interesting how our thinking, and I think many companies' thinking has changed a bit over the last number of years. Um, you know, the, the, the low-cost production for the portions of the battery that we build that, um, you know, are mainly the enclosure and the tanks and the pumps and the wiring and that kind of thing. We've been building that in, in China um, at, at low cost. And, uh, and, and now we see the need to have local manufacturer in areas where that we care about a lot. Now that said, we've done quite a bit of work at our facility in the energy super of Oxford was had final assembly uh, for Oxford project in Bathgate uh, right outside Edinburgh. But we're also looking at, U.S. projects probably need to be have U.S. manufacturing. Now, that will require government support, but the U.S. government has said that they are interested in doing that. So we can take our, our the components that have a lot of intellectual property around them, the cell stack uh, that we're currently building in Vancouver. So we can take them from Vancouver into the U.S., uh, and that's in, in, in British Columbia and Canada, or from Bathgate outside Edinburgh for projects in the UK, marry them together in with the balance of system, bring in electrolyte also often and hopefully uh, done um, locally. And now we're starting to get an energy infrastructure that also respects the, 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 the territory in which it finds itself, that it is providing a kind of energy independence. And you've talked a little bit about the sort of S-curve of production. There are so many opportunities. How easy is it to take production from the 30 megawatt hours that are currently forecast to double or to even more with the contract with Siemens Gamesa to gigawatt hours? What sort of timing are we looking to achieve that? And how complicated is it? How difficult is it? How many problems are, go are we going to incur getting? There. You know, the good thing is that there are many different um, companies that have solved the problem of taking a standardized product in low production and taking it to high production. And, and certainly Siemens Gamesa has done that uh, in, in, with multiple products, including wind turbines and, and, the, and the power systems that the Gamesa Electric build. And their company after company has done that. Uh, the, the key and the core is first and foremost, have a product that is designed to be manufactured at scale and in volume that it works well and is reliable and above all is is a, is is not subject to constant changing you know bespoke products which is what a lot of energy storage uh, is these days they are not susceptible to that kind of ramp up but we're quite confident and are doing work toward being able to build up that production and, and in in multiple areas we are benefiting from the fact that building our batteries doesn't require the same kind of gigafactory with incredibly precise, complex manufacturing processes that uh, lithium ion batteries do, or after all, so uh, the, the chips that are in short supply now do either. They, our batteries can be built using fairly standard production technologies, and that's a big benefit to us. Larry, thank you very, very much indeed. And we'll look forward to speaking to you again to get an update on how it's all progressing. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. It was good to talk with you, Tim's.